Good evening. I am Rick Peters, president of the Boston Medical Library. Welcome to the 46th annual Garland Lecture. The Boston Medical Library was founded in 1875 to serve the library needs of practicing physicians in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. The Garland Lecture is named in memory of Dr. Joseph Garland, who was the 13th president of the Boston Medical Library and a former editor of the New England Journal of Medicine. The Garland Lecture has been one of the proud traditions of the BML since 1976. Tonight's Garland Lecture is being combined with the Worcester District Medical Society's Cottle Lecture. The Cottle Lecture is named in memory of Dr. Lewis Cottle, whose generosity made possible this annual educational lecture. Originally, Worcester had planned a lecture by Dr. Robert Feinberg, a distinguished professor of medicine and chair emeritus of the Department of Medicine at UMass. Dr. Finberg died unexpectedly in August. And before we go any further, I ask for a moment of silence in his memory. Thank you. We are very fortunate to have Dr. Anthony Fauci with us this evening. Dr. Fauci is, a medical, is the medical advisor to the president and director of the NIH's Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease. More recently, he has become the face of the federal response to the COVID pandemic, where we have all benefited from his calm, clear guidance. Born in New York City, he's a graduate of Worcester's Holy Cross College, where he played basketball, and the Cornell Medical College. He did a residency in internal medicine at Cornell and joined the National Institutes of Health shortly after in 1968. He rose to director of the Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease in 1980. Since joining the NIH, Dr. Fauci has been immersed in both research in immunology and the public health responses to flu epidemics, HIV, Ebola, SARS, and MERS. His research in the immune response has led to breakthroughs in AIDS and other conditions. He's ranked among the top medical researchers in the world. Tonight, he is the 46th Garland lecturer, but he was also our 26th lecturer when he spoke to us on the threat of bioterrorism in the fall of 2001, just after the anthrax scare. Today's discussion will take the form of a fireside chat in which we will get at his thoughts regarding what he has learned and what he would like to see for the future of public health in America. Chatting with Dr. Fauci today will be Dr. Mary O'Brien, representing the Worcester District Medical Society, and Dr. Dale McGee from the Boston Medical Library. Dr. O'Brien is Associate Professor of Medicine at the UMass Medical School and a primary care internist. She chairs the Worcester Society's Medical Education Committee. Dr. Dale McGee is a retired obstetrician gynecologist and a past president of the Massachusetts Medical Society and is a board member of the Boston Medical Library. We will begin with Dr. McGee and then move on to Dr. O'Brien. Okay, good evening, Dr. Fauci. I'm Dale McGee. Good evening. Nice to see you. Thank you for joining us this evening and, and thank you also for all that you've done during this pandemic to keep people informed with a calm and clear voice. Uh, it's made such a difference and, and the, the country is a better place for all you've done. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, we're going to begin with me and I'm going to be speaking with you for about another 20 minutes or so, 25. And then Dr. O'Brien is gonna uh, come in and speak with you uh, for the rest of it. For those who are watching, um, you do have the ability to put questions in the Q&A field. And if we have time, we will select some of the questions and continue uh, the meeting until uh, we stop at approximately 7.45 uh, this evening. So you do have that option. Um, rather than speaking strictly about COVID, which is, is what I'm sure Dr. Fauci is used to speaking about on a, a daily basis on, with the media, uh, we thought that sooner or later, we are going to get to the, uh, to the next phase and uh, we need to prepare for the next pandemic. We need to understand what we've learned from what has happened over the past two years. And in, in looking at that, we thought there was no better person to, to have a conversation with than uh, Dr. Fauci. He not only was uh, pivotal 
in the responses that occurred during the past uh, year and a half or so here. But he has been uh, with the NIH for a little over 50 years and has uh, experienced uh, other crises in public health that have occurred. And so he's got an incredible perspective that virtually no one else can bring. So uh, with that, uh, let's get into it and, and say that with uh, what we have learned with this pandemic to inform uh, our future responses, what do you think the plan looks like uh, for version two? Well, Dr. McGee, one of the things that I think is really important is that people can compartmentalize preparedness from a scientific standpoint and from a public health standpoint. And public health can be divided into local and domestic public health and the interdigitation among countries in what we call global public health preparedness. Um, one of the things that I found really striking is that prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, Johns Hopkins School of Public Health did a ranking of the best and the worst prepared countries in the world for a pandemic outbreak of a transmissible infectious disease. And the United States was ranked first. Now, that's really interesting because if you look at the toll of suffering, morbidity, mortality, deaths now, over 725,000 deaths, we have not actually responded very well in the big picture. Being a rich country, supposedly with the resources to do whatever we wanted to do, and yet having suffered as bad or worse than most any other country, which tells us that any amount of preparedness, if you get a situation like we have with this unprecedented outbreak, the likes of which we have not experienced in over 100 years, you have to, as you're suggesting, look back and say, what do we want to do next time that is a bit better? One of the big success stories of this outbreak has been our scientific preparedness, because the investment that has been made in the research that led to a vaccine in less than 11 months from our identification of the sequence tells us that we were really on top of it when it came to scientific preparedness. Where we fell short, I believe, is that we assumed that the local domestic public health infrastructure was intact. The ability to identify, isolate, and contact trace. And we found out that we had let the local infrastructure of public health really attenuate over many, many years right now. And, you know, public health is global, but public health is also local and domestic. And that's something that I think we got a real uh, uh, smack in the face, as it were, to realize that we did not do very well. We bounced back, but it took us a while and a lot of, uh, I think, perhaps avoidable suffering and death to get us to the point. The next aspect of it is the global approach to have a global health security agenda, which we started years ago, but really didn't get off the ground as much as we wanted it to do. We have the interconnectivity, the transparency, and the communication among nations throughout the world so that when there is an outbreak, which you can, I don't think there's much you can do about the emergence of an infection that jumps species and goes into the human environment, but you can prevent that outbreak from becoming a pandemic by early responsiveness. And I think those are the things that we really have not done very well. I might just finish up, because I don't want to go too long on one question, but I just wanted to say that we have now put together out of the Office of Science and Technology Policy at the White House, a pandemic preparedness plan that would cost us about $65 billion over the next 10 years. And the reason I emphasize that is whenever I was involved in pandemic preparedness plans, because you mentioned that what I do goes all the way back and beyond the anthrax attacks when we, when I, the last time I was, I was at the Garland lectureship was during those period of times, is that we really have to appreciate that the, the lessons that we have learned from a decade or two ago are totally applicable 
right now. And we've really got to understand that when we ask for preparedness, our corporate memory is really very, very short. And I know demonstrating in the fact that I go before the Congress a year or two after an outbreak and talk about preparedness for something that hasn't happened yet, there's very little enthusiasm for that because there are enough problems that are already here that are clear and present and ongoing that we have a very tough time. I hope, I hope in conclusion <laughs> that the, the extraordinary unprecedented experience that we've all gone through, which is worse than anything we've had in over 100 years, is going to make that corporate memory last a bit longer so that when this is behind us, and you have people like myself and others going before the Congress, going before the administration, talking about a future investment that's measured in billions and decades, that we don't forget about the lessons that we've learned. Mm -hmm. You bring up an awful lot of interesting things here. I just want to tease out a few. Now, when we're talking about this investment to strengthen public health, is some of those dollars going to make it down to the local level? Well, they have to. I mean, that's really the point. I mean, it, it is essential that it makes it down to the local level, because I think that's where the obvious weaknesses became apparent as we were trying to essentially control things at a local public health level, which was really unfortunate. You know, in the early months, you might recall, Dr. McGee, that there was this issue where you know, let the states and the local do what they want. The federal government is going to keep hands off. The federal government has to support the locals. The locals will do things a little bit differently depending on whether you're in Boston or in Wyoming, but it has to get a full amount of support from the federal government. Right. And uh, with regard to international public health, uh, do you see that uh, this uh, program that is being proposed is as uh, building better connections with other countries? Oh, absolutely. You know, one of the things we absolutely need, and I think we've seen that, is we do need a World Health Organization. I mean, it, it, we may not like the World Health Organization that we've had, but we need a World mm -hmm. Health Organization, and we really de do need to strengthen it. Because uh, early on, at the end of the last administration, trying to pull back out of the WHO was, I believe, a real mistake. And I was very pleased that the first thing, literally the first thing that President Biden asked me to do the day before he became inaugurated was to call up the WHO at their uh, World Health Assembly and to tell them that we want to get back into the WHO. Mm -hmm. Great. And um, so with the pandemic that we just experienced, there were distribution issues, there were decision making issues, and um, uh, what do you, you know, we ran into certain things such as uh, vaccine hesitancy, where we had the technology, we manufactured the vaccine, and still we uh, ran into issues regarding uh, uptake. Uh, what has your experience been with that? What, uh, what are your thoughts with regard to yeah. vaccine hesitancy? You know, that is a complicated issue, Dr. McGee, because uh, we always have a relatively small element a vaccine hesitancy that we've experienced for a long period of time. It was particularly uh, obvious around the area that certain subgroups in certain areas of the country were essentially anti-vax and fell below a certain level in the measles uh, percentage of people vaccinated. And that's where we had outbreaks, many outbreaks in places like in New York City in the upper Westchester area in certain places in Minnesota, in certain places in California, in Northern California. But the idea of the degree of vaccine hesitancy that we are experiencing now, I think is unfortunately a reflection of what I find to be a highly perplexing, but extraordinarily disturbing divisiveness in our society, where whether or not you get vaccinated, and it even spills over into whether or not you wear a mask, is really an, an expression of political ideology, which, you know, doesn't make any sense. You know, and as a public health person, it's, it's a combination of painful and frustrating for me to see that 
when you have a public health crisis, there's no doubt that the common enemy is the virus. And yet we in this country have been acting as if the enemy is each other. And I, you know, and I've, of all of the public health issues that I've been involved with, I have never seen a degree of profound and intense divisiveness that expresses itself in an extraordinarily unfortunate way. Is people not getting vaccinated purely on the basis of ideology. Um, and again, that, that's almost inexplicable. But as you know, if you look at the undervaccinated states and the states that are highly vaccinated, they very evenly fall into red and blue states, which is yeah. ridiculous. <laughs> so I guess the, the big thing here is, is there a way of dialing down the level of politics involved with public health? I, you know, in an ideal world, public health would, would be apolitical. And uh, it, it appears that that uh, that is not the case at all. What's your perspective on that? Or is there any way to address that? Is there any way to dial down the intense politics involved with this? Um, you know, if it would be easy, I, I would say, yeah, but it is, is not. It, it's just so ingrained in the divisiveness that we have. The only way I feel that we can do it is to not throw up your hands and give up, but try to get trusted messengers that are not politically or ideologically motivated to talk to the people who are really seemingly refractory to moving ahead to getting vaccinated. So that even though from an ideological standpoint, you might feel strongly one way or the other, if your clergy person or your physician, your pediatrician, um, a family member that's trusted talks to you about why it's important to get vaccinated. I believe that can begin to break down those ideological barriers, which are really so problematic. But I don't think it's going to be easy, Dr. McGee. I really don't. I, I'm... Yeah. Well, if I hear you correctly, I think what I'm hearing is, is that we need to strengthen the local messaging, strengthen the local relationships, and maybe even dial down the national ones to a degree. Because uh, it, it seems that the higher up the message comes from, the more political it, it tends to be, and that the people that those that people trust are are the ones who they see every day. Um, yeah. But you've you so, uh, advise seven presidents, and uh, what role does presidential leadership play in the response to outbreaks? <laughs> Uh, it, 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 it can play a, a very important role, um, mostly positive if the president uses the position of the bully pulpit to get something done that might not otherwise get done. And also, there can be a negative to it, uh, which I think has become obvious over the last few years. One of the examples that I always give about presidential leadership um, is during the George W. Bush administration. Uh, I had the absolute honor and privilege of the president asking me, because he was thinking about it all along, a, a man of extraordinary integrity and compassion and empathy felt that member it was 2002, and we had already been several years into the combination uh, antiretroviral therapy that had transformed the lives of people, mostly in developed countries. And he was concerned that countries, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa and the Caribbean, because they didn't have the resources, that they were dying of a disease for which we had very adequate therapy and people who are living with HIV and had access to antiretrovirals were leading essentially a normal life. And President Bush asked me to go to Africa and to see if it is feasible that if we put the resources in, that we could get people on therapy, prevent infection, and get them into care if we put enough resources. I did that. I spent time in Southern Africa, and I came back saying it is feasible but it's going to cost billions of dollars and it's going to be an investment that would be measured in decades. And to his enduring credit, 
President Bush said, let us do it. And when I said it's going to cost a lot of money, he said, let me worry about the money. Let's just get the plan and put it together. And that was the birth of PEPFAR. You know, in PEPFAR, the president's emergency plan for AIDS relief has now clearly saved literally millions of lives, predominantly in low and middle income countries and predominantly in sub-Saharan Africa. That would not have happened had it not been for the initiative and the support of President George W. Bush. So I think that's a very cogent answer to your question about how leadership at the level of the president can really be very important in global health issues. And yet, if I remember correctly, he catalyzed this, he, he uh, enabled it to happen, he got you working on it, but he really wasn't front and center on this as far as a lot of attention on himself with regard to the, the uh, effort. Uh, he yeah. got it done. Well, you know, it's very interesting, uh, just something, a little, an anecdote that you and the audience might want to hear, that, you know, you can have your own opinion about George W. Bush regarding a number of other issues, but he's an extraordinary person. He could have stepped forward and taken a lot of credit for that, but he was extraordinarily modest about it, almost to a fault, where he really wanted to stay behind the scenes. And the only thing he was interested in was having it happen as opposed to who got credit for it. Yeah. I, I seem to recall he making a remark one time that if you uh, involve a politician in, in an effort, you get some of his supporters and all of his enemies. And, and so it's best to stay in the background. And, and uh, I think that was uh, an important message that he delivered. Um, now, with regard to um, uh, communications, I think one of the other th major challenges here is that the discovery was occurring while while the pandemic was unfolding. And so the science was happening. We were we were making break breakthroughs. But science as it is, is not always progressing in a straight line. It's not always easy to understand. And uh, we're in the position of having to communicate with the public uh, as the science evolves. We're going to have to communicate a level of uncertainty. Uh, what have you learned about that? Because most people don't deal well with uncertainty. Yeah. Well, you know, Dr. McGee, that, that has been uh, for me and for some of my colleagues a most extraordinary experience. And I believe that people who are involved in science and, and public health could understand it. When you are dealing, as we were, I mean, we, we, we were in the middle of a, of a truly evolving and unfolding phenomenon. And that phenomenon in this case is the evolving of a pandemic where on the first week, you did not know what you were dealing with. The first month was not what you ultimately knew on month four, five, six, seven, and eight. So you're seeing things evolve and you have to communicate because it's essential to communicate with the public and not only communicate, but you have to come across with recommendations and guidelines based on an evolving, moving target. And that is a very fine line and a tightrope to walk where you want to get as much information as you can, but you know the data are changing. You know, and if you go through those early weeks, I mean, it, it's sort of like um, a real-time evolution. So you have a new pneumonia that's seen in Wuhan the Chinese are saying it almost certainly jumped from an animal to a human, which is almost certainly the case that what happened. Yet they're saying we don't think it's very transmissible from human to human. Then a couple of weeks later, they're well, wait a minute, it is transmissible from human to human. Then a couple of weeks later, well, it's very transmissible from human to human. Because remember, the original SARS, which was a coronavirus, was not particularly good at transmitting from person to person. And the big difference from the original SARS-1 and SARS-CoV-2, which was the game changer for us, which really got us to realize, oh my goodness, this is different, is that about 50 to 60% of the transmissions occurred from someone who was without symptoms, either someone who would never get symptoms because this is an incredibly perplexing disease where it can kill millions of people and yet it makes so many people have no symptoms at all. That we were realizing 
that it was being transmitted in a large part by people who had no symptoms. That had a major impact on whether you wear a mask, whether you stay indoors, all the kinds of things that evolved over months. Now, if you were looking at it from the outside and wanted to be super critical, you could say, you know, you scientists and public health people, you keep changing your tune. You keep flip-flopping and saying one thing or the other. It isn't because when you're dealing with a completely evolving situation, you have to evolve with the science. Because if you stay Mm -hmm. static in where you are, you're gonna be way behind what's actually going on in reality. So your, your question is a very relevant question. It is very challenging to communicate in a way that's understandable and believable at the same time that you're having a rapidly evolving situation. Right, thank you so much. I'm gonna turn things over to my colleague, Dr. Mary O'Brien, uh, but I've thoroughly enjoyed uh, speaking with you this evening, uh, Dr. Fauci. Uh, thank you very much, same here, Dr. McGee. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. McGee, and welcome again, Dr. Fauci. It's truly an honor to have you here this evening. So I'm gonna pick up where Dr. McGee left off and I'm gonna ask the next question. So uh, one of the issues that the pandemic brought to real clear light was that of racial disparity with racial and ethnic minorities being more affected by COVID and having less access to vaccines. How does one guarantee equity in clinical trial recruitment and an availability and distribution of countermeasures such as meds and vaccines? Well, that's a great question. I'm glad you're you're giving me the opportunity to answer that because during the clinical trials, the Moderna and the Pfizer and the J&J, where we used some of our clinical trial capabilities to assist the pharmaceutical companies, we made it a very important task to make sure that there was equity in the representation within the clinical trials of uh, African Americans and Hispanics and to the extent possible, Native Americans, because we knew that if they were not included in the trial, there would always be the question of whether or not it was safe and effective in them. So that was the first step. And I think we did a good job in that because early on, if you let clinical trial uh, recruitment and accrual into trial to its own devices, it will be mostly white people. I mean, for sure, because it's easy to recruit um, and people tend to do that. And when you get a fee for recruitment, you wind up doing the easiest thing. Well, we stepped in and made sure that that was not the case. But the thing that troubled me more and still does. And, and that's why I, 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 I um, welcome speaking about it so that people will understand it, is that if you look at COVID-19 and you look at the infection rate among brown and black people, purely on the basis of the kinds of jobs they have that generally put them out in the public with essential jobs, as opposed to what you and I are doing, talking to each other through a Zoom. Number two, if you look at the underlying medical conditions that they have, it makes them much more prone to a severe outcome once they do get infected with SARS-CoV-2. So what's the reason for that? In my mind, it sheds a very bright light on something we've known for a long period of time, that the social determinants of health put minorities at a disadvantage at virtually every type of disease, including outbreaks, including HIV, including influenza, and certainly with COVID-19. So the one thing I do hope, we, you know, I was talking to Dr. McGee about lessons learned just a few minutes ago. The one thing I do hope that this jolts us into realizing that it took decades, if not centuries, to get the social determinants of health to put brown and black people essentially at a phenomenal disadvantage. And we've got to face it, it relates to the racism in society. You can't run away from that. That's just a fact. So if ever we're going to come out of this with a big lesson learned is to realize that we've got to start now to trying to overcome and reverse 
these social determinants of health, which continue to put minorities, particularly African Americans and Hispanics, at a disadvantage. So when all this is over and we're looking back at it, we've got to realize that we've got to do something. It's going to probably take decades to reverse that. It's not going to happen overnight. But such a stark example of the disproportionate burden that was faced by African Americans and Hispanics. Yes, I agree. Um, along the same lines is what is our responsibility in the USA um, and other rich countries in providing countermeasures such as vaccines to some of the lower and middle income countries? Well, it relates to what I had described a few moments ago to Dr. McGee about uh, the George W. Bush PEPFAR situation where he, his words to me were, you know, Tony, I believe, and, and I totally agree with him, that we have a moral obligation as a rich nation to not allow people to suffer disproportionately from a disease or an affliction that we are protected against, but because of where they were born and where they live, they are at a severe disadvantage. So as far as I'm concerned, I think it's an obligation of the developed world, including and particularly the United States, because we're such a rich country, to do whatever we can to get doses of vaccine to the low and middle income countries. And in this regard, you know, we've already either given or promised, and we will deliver, I'll guarantee you that, over 1.1 billion doses before we get into the middle of next year but also to work with the pharmaceutical companies to expand their capacity to get doses. We cannot be in our country, get, like right now we have 77% of adults having received at least one dose of a vaccine. We have 95% of the elderly over 65 who received at least one dose and 85% of the elderly that are fully vaccinated. You go to Southern Africa, they may have 5% of the population that are vaccinated. So we absolutely need to address that. And I do say it unabashedly that I believe it's a moral obligation. We can't walk away from that. Not only us, but all the developed nations, the European Union, the UK, Australia, Canada, we all need to do that. And the, the drug companies themselves. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. You know, if you look at the I mean, I'm I'm very much of the capitalistic approach to drug companies and put the investment they make in research and development. I, I grant them that that's good. But they have made billions and billions and billions of dollars on this. So they have to step to the plate. Absolutely. Absolutely. OK, next question. Uh, Angela Rasmussen, a virologist at Georgetown University, said in a New York Times piece that you were a part of a few months ago, we really do need to have a larger conversation about working together as a global community for future outbreaks. What is the role of international transparency and cooperation in a pandemic response? Oh, it's, ab it's absolutely critical. I mean, no doubt about that. Um, you know, one of the issues that we had early on with China is that whenever you have a totalitarian country, whenever there's something that happens, they always try to cover things up, even though there's nothing to cover up. <laughs> you know, it's the same thing that happened with SARS-CoV-1 when there was an outbreak in China and they were saying it's just an atypical influenza when it wasn't, it was a brand new coronavirus. So we've really got to have complete transparency and not be concerned that if an outbreak begins in your country, it's not your fault. And that's the seemingly, you know, nobody wants to admit something because they think they're going to get blamed for it. I mean, if it's a natural occurrence, it's a natural occurrence. There's no one to blame there. OK, so now I'll uh, talk a little bit more about science here. Um, Really, once the full SARS-CoV-2 viral genome was encoded, there were almost immediately 15 to 20 different vaccines that were um, you know, being uh, worked on. How were you able to develop a vaccine so quickly? Uh, it's a great story that <laughs> warms the hearts of all of us who support basic and clinical biomedical research. 
You know, it were two converging things that came and it was just such a beautiful story. So you have to have a vaccine platform that's an optimal platform. And obviously everybody knows that the mRNA platform has been just a groundbreaking transformative advance. And then you have to have the optimal immunogen to give an optimal immunogenic response. So what was happening, and I wrote a, 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 a commentary in science about this in an April edition of science, the story behind the COVID-19 vaccine. And, it, and people say, well, wait a minute, you just saw the sequence on January 9th of 2020, and you have vaccine going into the arms of people who are highly effective and safe in December. That's 11 months. That's completely impossible. Well, for 15 to 20 years before that, you had people like Drew Weissman and Katie Carrico, both of whom won, just won the Lasker Award for their work in making the mRNA molecule amenable to being used as a vaccine by some ingenious manipulation of the molecule to not allow it to trigger an innate immune response, which would have obviated its use as a vaccine platform. So at the same time, investigators in the, in the NIAID Vaccine Research Center were working on the right conformation of the spike protein to keep it stabilized in its pre-fusion form, which made it optimally immunogenic. That was work that was in the making for the previous 15 years. So all of those things came together and as soon as the sequence came out on the public database from China, literally within days, both of those things converged. The immunogen together with the platform, and 65 days later, we were in a phase one trial. That is inconceivable that it could have been that fast. And the only reason it happened was because of the extraordinary investment that was made in basic and clinical biomedical research. Along the same lines, Operation Warp Speed was an incredible tribute to scientific discovery in collaboration with public health. Um, and, it, you know, why was that so successful? <laughs> it was successful because we took a phenomenal risk. And the risk was not to the safety or to the integrity of the science, the risk was purely a financial risk. And it was a, it's a really interesting story because when you develop a product like a vaccine, you usually don't make an investment in step two until you're pretty sure about step one. And you don't make an investment in step three until you have some confidence that step two is gonna work. With Operation Warp Speed, we said, we absolutely have time is of the essence. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna invest billions of dollars in pre-purchasing and pre-producing a product that we don't even know if it's gonna work. Now, no way in the normal workings of private industry would that ever be allowable by the board of directors of a pharmaceutical company. So what happened? The United States federal government came in and said, we will take the risk. We will invest billions of dollars to do this. All you've got to do is make your product and we'll take it from there. So it was a phenomenal financial risk that paid off. And I got to tell you, uh, Dr. O'Brien, that this is going to go into the history books about, about how we did something that would have, would have been deemed impossible, merely by the investment of literally billions and billions of dollars. Great. So another, another science question. Um, the emergence of viral variants has illustrated the virus's attempt at survival and spread. And we've all heard about the different variants. Explain how these viral variants arise and why are they important and what might future variants look like? Well, a variant is, is, is a virus that's different enough 
from the original wild type that it really becomes truly of an important variation of the virus. And it is caused by usually more than one, a constellation of mutations that allow it to assume new phenotypic properties that the original wild type didn't have. RNA viruses mutate all the time. Most of the mutations are irrelevant and have no functional consequence. But every once in a while, you get enough mutations to give you a variant of a virus that either gets transmitted more rapidly or is more pathogenic, more deadly, or what have you. The classic example of that is what we're dealing with right now, the Delta variant. Because the Delta variant is extraordinarily more transmissible than the other variants that we had to deal with. And the level of virus, for example, that you isolate from the nasopharynx is up to a thousand times more than the alpha variant. So it becomes a highly transmissible, which is shown by the fact that 99% of all of the isolates right now in the United States that are sequenced are Delta variant. So in answer to your question, variants keep arising if you give the virus the opportunity to mutate. So there's a very simple, if not simplistic tenet in virology that viruses don't mutate unless you allow them to replicate. And when they replicate by spreading throughout the community, you give it an ample opportunity to mutate. And then it is entirely conceivable that the right constellation of mutations is going to give a variant that could conceivably evade the protection of the vaccines that we have. That's the reason why bringing in several of the questions that you and Dr. McGee had asked is that as long as there's viral replication anywhere on the planet, there's the likelihood that you're going to get a variant and hopefully never will, but could evade vaccine. So that's the reason why you can say absolutely that a global pandemic absolutely requires a global response. You can't have us in our cocoon here thinking that we're safe when you have millions of people spreading the infection throughout the rest of the world. Okay, so people often ask what keeps you up at night, Dr. Fauci, and what is your worst nightmare? Let us know. (laughs) You know, um, people have asked me that, uh, uh, Dr. O'Brien, for years and years. And unfortunately, my worst nightmare is what we are living through right now. Um, uh, I have gotten asked over the decades, what is the thing that worries you most? Just the way you asked me, what keeps you up at night? And it is a new virus, generally that one that likely jumps from an animal reservoir to a human, that's respiratory born, and that has two characteristics that conflate. One, it's that it's highly, highly transmissible. And two, that it has the capability of a high degree of morbidity and mortality. And here we are in 2021 living through my worst nightmare. Uh, And unfortunately, you know, it's the kind of thing that we haven't experienced in well over a hundred years. So I hope that we never ever again have this experience, which gets to some of the questions you asked about pandemic preparedness looking ahead. And finally, because we're getting close to the time, um, I think many of us get this question every day and I'd really like to get your perspective. I know you've talked a little bit about it. When do you think we will return to normal and what will our new normal really look like? You know, getting back to normal, Dr. O'Brien, is is gonna be a gradual process. It's not gonna be a switch, you turn it on and you turn it off. You know, I generally like to explain it in multiple phases. There's the pandemic phase globally, There's the epidemic phase in a country, there's control, there's elimination, and there's eradication. We only eradicated one virus in history, and that's smallpox. We've controlled a number. I mean, we've eliminated a number. We've eliminated polio from the United States. We've eliminated malaria from the United States. We've eliminated measles, except for some pockets. So... We may not eliminate it completely, but if we get it somewhere 
between control and elimination, where the level of spread and the level of protection in the community, either from prior infection or from vaccination, is so widespread that the virus really doesn't have a lot of vulnerable targets. So that you'll get an intermittent infection here or there, but it will not be a public health issue. And I think that we can get there in the next year or so. It's not going to be January 2022, I'll guarantee you that. Mm -hmm. But it's going to be a gradual process where we get greater and greater control until we almost get on the cusp of elimination. But it's going to require our getting many, many more people vaccinated than we have right now. Thank you. So it looks like we are coming to a close this evening. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity on behalf of both the Worcester District Medical Society and the Boston Medical Library to thank you so much, Dr. Fauci, for spending this time with us tonight and sharing your keen perspective. I know we've all been looking forward to it. It's been so educational and enlightening. Um, and to all of our participants, um, we thank you for joining us. We hope you enjoyed this presentation. Um, we wish you good health and a great evening. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Good to be with you.